All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, now, uh, I'm mindful that uh, I guess for a number of you, you're going to be heading back on the motorway uh, in about an hour's time. So hopefully that experience will be forever changed after listening to this presentation. Now then, um, the theme of today uh, is uh, networks and infrastructure. So I thought it might be nice if we took uh, a little test drive uh, through some networks and infrastructure, but a test drive with a difference, um, an historical test drive, in fact. Um, we're going to journey back uh, to when today was yesterday's tomorrow, uh, as it were. Uh, we're going to journey back to when rover engineering um, was not a topic of uh, ridicule or mockery, but when it actually took you years ahead. Um, this is a, a rover P6, uh, and we're going to take a journey uh, into the city of the future. Uh, this is uh, Glasgow, apparently, um, as we imagined it would be in 1990. Um, I can quote from the, the planning documents, which says that while travelling at the vaguely shocking speed of 50 miles per hour, motorists would be able to orientate themselves to the city centre through all these brave new modernist architecture uh, alongside. Uh, of course, um, one has to be careful um, when building this sort of infrastructure that you don't want to totally dwarf the uh, existing uh, architecture. So, uh, borrowing from American freeway best practice, we had this concept of the uh, uh, depressed urban motorway. That's uh, different from a, a, a depressing urban motorway, and that, that came later. Um, but, but you can see that with some judicious use of shrubs and planting, um, one is able to get sort of people and concrete in perfect harmony. Uh, indeed, uh, we just have to wait now for the citizens of the future to come along uh, and populate this wonderful built environment that we've provided for them. Uh, that's as it looks today, and obviously um, how, how we laugh now at these kind of naive uh, visions. Uh, I guess uh, nostalgia isn't what it used to be. Anyway, um, my name is uh, Dr Guy Walker. I'm from the School of the Built Environment. Um, and the reason for presenting this kind of clashing vision of uh, aspiration and, and reality uh, is, is to make kind of two points, really. Uh, the first is that um, our kind of visions of what sort of networks and infrastructure, uh, in particular transport networks, uh, they kind of changed over the years. Um, we, we've kind of realised uh, technology alone isn't enough. You know, we can't keep sort of building our way out of problems. Uh, the paradigm has very much shifted. Um, you know, we're confronted with challenges now which we take a lot more seriously. Uh, climate change, resource depletion, other societal values which are important to us. Um, aside from that, uh, the second point um, is that actually uh, all this stuff is, is really quite old. And when you travel home tonight, um, take a close look at some of these structures. Um, a lot of them have got cracks in them big enough for you to put your hand in. Um, so some of it's about 50 years old, uh, possibly. Um, and the interesting thing really is that a lot of this infrastructure has kind of woven itself into the fabric of everyday life that you know we, we don't even think about it anymore. Um, but I say that there's still no getting away from the fact that uh, pretty soon a lot of this stuff's going to be kind of life expired um, uh, and we're going to have to do something about it. Um, now, as I say, because the, the kind of paradigm has, has shifted uh, and we're no longer thinking in terms of just simply you know, providing more of this infrastructure, building more, um, the challenge now actually uh, is becoming, uh, you know, making the most uh, of what the kind of uh, white heat of the technological revolution of the 60s gave us. Um, the emphasis now is switching more to kind of uh, maintaining this sort of infrastructure, um, you know, getting the most out of it, get, making sure it performs to its maximum capabilities. Um, what that means in practice, uh, slightly depressingly, uh, uh, is roadworks. Um, and if you thought the roadworks you've got at the moment are bad, uh, it's nothing compared to what's coming around the corner. Because uh, despite the appearances to the contrary, a lot of those structures haven't really been touched for 50 years or more. Uh, and people are beginning to sweat now uh, that, 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 that you know, some of it is literally, uh, well, it's not quite going to fall down, but it, it's, it's not far off. So um, if you can't simply build our way out of this problem, um, the, the kind of problem itself has kind of changed. It's, it's no longer purely uh, an engineering problem. Uh, it, it's become more sort of a multi disciplinary problem, uh, I suppose. We, we see that kind of multidisciplinary approach uh, reflected um, uh, you know, throughout sort of the academic sector, uh, and particularly uh, at this university. Uh, you know, we have you know, departments of civil engineering becoming schools of the, the built environment, for example. Um, you know, the, the boundaries between disciplines becoming uh, more blurred. Uh, and in my case, um, you have uh, psychologists uh, uh, working in engineering departments uh, uh, I say, in order to sort of work at the, the boundaries of these interesting problems. Now then, 
Uh, this type of interdisciplinary work, I think, is a uh, strong feature of Heriot Watch. And I thought I'd take the opportunity uh, to show you some of the things uh, it can give you. Um, I thought I'd do that by um, uh, posing you a slightly trick question, so fingers on buzzers. Um, this uh, kind of green vista here is actually uh, Paisley. Um, it's the M8 Junction 29, to be precise. Uh, and standing by the side of the road is a little grey box which counts all the cars as they uh, uh, go past it uh, in this particular location. So what we see uh, on a typical uh, weekday um, between hours of, sort of about eight and nine, uh, we're getting about sort of, I don't know, 820 odd vehicles per hour per lane uh, down this route. Uh, so everything's sort of flowing along uh, quite nice and happily. So that, that, that amounts to, as I say, about 2,470 vehicles per hour. So the question is, uh, if some of this infrastructure is getting a bit worn out, and we're thinking about roadworks, what happens if we progressively have to sort of close off lanes and, and you know, adjust the traffic flows across them? Uh, well, straight away, if we, we, we shut down one lane, you'd think, well, um, you know, we're immediately going to lose 823 vehicles per hour per lane of capacity. But, but in actual fact, uh, traffic flow theory tells us that if we reduce the speed, the cars will be travelling more closely together, and we can actually gain a lot of that capacity back. Uh, so according to the kind of the theories, and also in, in practice, because there's many other situations where out on the road network, uh, we have these kind of lane drops. Uh, uh, in actual fact, um, you know, you, you can still get a pretty healthy throughput through uh, these sorts of situations. Now, th those sorts of assumptions uh, are built into uh, the, the traffic simulations that we create when we're, we're trying to sort of plan these kind of roadworks. Um, so at the moment, they're sort of predicting um, that we'll be able to flow about 2,000 odd vehicles per hour through here. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, w when those sorts of ideas come into contact uh, with the real world, we see something uh, slightly different. Um, actual flow rates through this situation uh, are down to only 1,530 uh, vehicles per hour, which is 38% fewer cars than we actually think we're able to get through there. Uh, and the reason for that isn't due to engineering um, or, or technology, uh, it's actually due to, to driver behaviour and a, a phenomenon that um, I'm sure many of you have come across whereby um, you, you see the signs for roadworks ahead and you, you get slightly nervous, so you sort of move into lane one and then as you get nearer, you see all those crafty people trying to carve in front of you so you kind of get closer to the car in front, it all gets a bit competitive and fraught. Um, well, that kind of isolated phenomena, when you kind of magnify it up uh, to the entire traffic stream, um, as I say, uh, this is what it gives rise to, um, a yeah, significant reduction in capacity. Uh, why is that a problem? Uh, it's because if we assume that uh, uh, we're going to provide this amount of room, we're expecting this amount of congestion, so we design our roadworks, so we've got enough room on the network to kind of hold the queue that we expect is going to be forming. Um, but if everyone in that traffic stream is kind of jockeying for position and getting all competitive and getting into road rage debates with their fellow motorists, uh, and we get that kind of reduction in capacity, uh, uh, because the network is, is quite full already, those effects can begin to sort of propagate back through the network, uh, spreading around the whole strategic network, clogging up uh, the entire city, giving rise to a kind of automotive Armageddon, which is even further removed from the the vision of the 60s uh, that, than we have today. So that, that's where kind of human factors uh, approach comes into this. Um, human factors is a, 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 a branch of science that uh, uh, exists on the boundary of uh, engineering uh, and psychology. Um, it's about matching, uh, you know, uh, well, anything, artifacts, products, uh, environments, infrastructures, uh, to the physical and, and mental capabilities and limitations uh, of the people who will be using those things. Uh, and, it, and it's this kind of topic area, uh, I'd say, that exists on the boundary um, uh, of two disciplines, um, uh, which can give us, well, it offers us the potential, which I'll, I'll show you, uh, for us to create some uh, highly cost-effective, um, clever uh, uh, solutions um, with the potential to have effects that are, are much bigger, uh, more favourable than we expect. So, let's go back to Paisley. Uh, this probably looks familiar to most of you. This is what's waiting for you in about half an hour's time. Um, now then, I thought it might be helpful. Uh, you, you can all turn to page one of your introductory book on psychology here. I mean, we can talk a little bit about the kind of, in everyday language, kind of thought processes that are existing in the traffic stream um, uh, before we even get to a set of roadworks. 
Uh, and a number of uh, big studies have been performed in the past and um, looking into kind of driving style. Uh, I don't know if anyone's driven in a, in a foreign country. Uh, I see a few of you nodding ahead. Well, you can already appreciate that uh, differences in driving style, uh, they, you know, they, they can become quite apparent. But here in the UK, uh, when we, we kind of measure these, these things, uh, we see perhaps unsurprisingly, um, drivers have a, a propensity or a preference for, for driving fast rather than driving slowly. That's not especially surprising. Uh, what's slightly more interesting is that um, whilst they're doing this, uh, drivers say that they're quite kind of calm, uh, or, or, they, or they like to stay calm, or to put it another way, um, they like to avoid uh, kind of anxiety and negative emotions of, of that kind. So often people will behave in such a way, um, as I say, to kind of you know, reduce their kind of anxiety level. Um, we've also got this idea, it's got the grandiose name of uh, social resistance, but what it basically means is that um, actually uh, drivers can be quite easily subject to the influence of others. Um, I, I don't know how you feel when a car behind is like really close behind you, clearly wanting to overtake. Um, you may not change your behaviour, but you certainly, you're, you're aware of their presence and you, you might not like it. Um, but it's more subtle than that. Um, you, you know, even how the speed of other motorists around you, other behaviours, um, you know, people are sensitive to that and, and they will adapt their behaviour uh, accordingly. Uh, then there's this slightly dubious thing they call deviance. So what, what they really mean is that um, uh, people generally sort of comply with the rules or say they do. Um, but it's not just the kind of rules of the road, the highway code, it's also the kind of unwritten rules, the kind of driving culture out there, you know, the norms and expectations. Um, I, I don't know if you drive on the M8, for example, but it, you know, a, a particular kind of norm on that road is that everyone stays in the outside lane, so they don't want to get stuck behind a lorry on the inside lane, for example. So it's those kind of things. Uh, again, uh, the, the people have a propensity to kind of, you know, sort of conform, I suppose, is, is the way to put it. Now, all these things kind of exist uh, in the traffic stream before we even get to uh, a set of roadworks. Uh, and they all kind of come into play at different moments uh, in order to give rise to these phenomena which uh, then reduce capacity uh, significantly. So, um, it, it, these, to give you an idea of this kind of uh, the thought process, as it were, uh, drivers tend to start with a, you know, an intention you know, to undertake some sort of behaviour. Uh, it might be that, uh, you know, faced with roadworks ahead, they think I'm going to move into lane one at the earliest opportunity. Um, they have a kind of a, an attitude towards this behaviour um, and part of that is kind of shaped by perhaps previous encounters or witnessing what happens uh, when you embark on these particular behaviours. So basically by moving into lane one uh, you know you, you, you're doing that because then you won't get stranded uh, in the outside lanes uh, and, and be subject to the opprobrium of your fellow motorists. Then there's also something called the, the, the subjective norm um, uh, which is basically, it's about what other people around you are doing, uh, which again sort of helps to sort of shape what is kind of regarded as acceptable behaviour. So basically, if you kind of conform to what everyone else is doing, uh, th then, then you're kind of, um, you're not inviting any sort of unwanted uh, attention, which uh, again is, is a kind of a negative emotion that people like to tend to try and avoid, uh, especially driving. And then finally, there's something called perceived behavioural control. That is, uh, in your car, um, if you've got room around you, you know, you, you've got the, the kind of degrees of freedom to undertake these behaviours um, should you wish to, to do them. All of which converge uh, on the actual behaviour um, that, that emerges in practice. So let's have a look at this um, subjective norm uh, idea first. Uh, and, and a strange quirk of kind of motorway driving, which you may or may not be aware of, um, I don't know if this sounds familiar to you, but um, I, I noticed it uh, and I read about it and it's a scientific uh, fact, uh, is that everyone does indeed seem to be going faster than you and that's because, uh, and, it, and it's getting worse, because um, it, as traffic densities uh, increase, so if you, um, that, that's a feature of the road network in general, but if you drive at peak hours as well, um, you, you get this strange sort of relationship whereby, uh, in actual fact, the time you spend overtaking other people is less than the, the average time that other people spend overtaking you. Uh, why does that matter? Um, it's because you observe the behaviour of other road users um, and you then perceive that drivers, you're being overtaken more than you seem to be overtaking, which basically means you misperceive uh, other traffic lanes to be moving faster than you, uh, which then, uh, because of, you know, generally speaking, drivers want to conform to social norms, um, you'll tend to try and sort of match your behaviour to others, so you may change lane or speed up or whatever. 
Uh, and that, I say, that, that gives rise to things like, um, uh, it's almost like behavioral <laughs> contagion. You know, old traffic streams kind of speed up in a kind of, you know, behavior's contagious. And, and, but it's not just speeding, it's other phenomena uh, that, that also arise. Uh, and again, it's these sorts of processes that come into play, uh, which again, give rise to these unexpected yet undesirable uh, traffic phenomena, which cause traffic engineers uh, a lot of problems. Okay, uh, through the wonder of clip art, let's put in some roadworks. Right, so, so I can feel everyone's sort of blood pressure kind of going up uh, already. Um, so here we are. Um, so so, so we, the key thing is here um, is that strange things happen to drivers when they see roadwork signs because, I say, all over the network there's instances where um, three lanes go down to two and, you know, it's fine broadly. But it's something unique uh, about roadworks uh, and traffic signs and all the rest of it uh, that, that seems to activate quite powerful social processes um, which, I say, give rise to these problems we have. Uh, one of which uh, is uh, the effect of crowding. Um, as you get more sort of congestion, uh, the behaviours that you want to perform, like changing lanes or, I don't know, doing a U-turn and getting out of here, you can no longer do those because you're, you're kind of boxed in, you, you know, you can't escape. Uh, and there's this idea of a kind of a, um, uh, like a sort of frustration, aggression hypothesis, they call it. But, but this sort of thing is sort of a, a source of um, uh, I say frustration, which is manifest in, in, in certain behaviours. Uh, then we come back to this idea of sort of a, a subjective norm. You know, you, you see everyone else getting um, you know, frustrated and slightly anxious uh, and refusing to let people into the traffic queue, and then people tend to copy that behaviour, um, meaning that um, uh, it really is bad luck if you get stuck in the outside lane and people get stranded there for quite some time uh, when you monitor the CCTV. Uh, and say, uh, and all of that, um, when you kind of magnify that up, you know, to the, perhaps the 2,000 odd cars that are going through there per hour, and we're trying to go through there, uh, that's 2,000 potential actual driving behaviours which can become uh, quite dramatic. Um, and the other thing is, uh, there's this idea how drivers like to be perceived uh, in a way. Um, you know, we hear all these stereotypes of, you know, white van man, and um, I'm, I'm being careful on an industry day, not to mention particular brands of cars, but, uh, but, but you, know, uh, that, you know, there are certain sort of car subpopulations, as it were, um, but, but people like to sort of present themselves through their behaviour um, so that they, they don't invite, uh, you know, negative behaviours from other motorists. Um, uh, and that, again, sort of tends to make people conform to certain uh, behavioural norms. So, that's a, a kind of a, a long way for a, a shortcut. What does this all this mean in practice? Well, well basically, um, the, the key thing, and we see this uh, a lot across all sorts of engineering domains, uh, but in this particular one, it, it's actually driver behaviour. It's nothing to do with the engineering as such, uh, but causes us to lose the equivalent of uh, an extra lane of capacity, um, you know, unexpectedly. What we can do, um, but because we can understand uh, the processes that underpin that, um, we can then understand um, that the kind of the sources of error, where these kind of social processes are likely to be coming into play. Um, and what we can do, we can incorporate this knowledge um, into our sort of traffic micro simulation models, which is what we're doing uh, in this particular project, uh, in order that we can make them uh, perform better, you know, conform to real life in a better way, which means we can plan our roadworks uh, in more effective ways, uh, you know, avoiding frustration and all the things you encounter out the road. But the real key, I suppose, uh, is that all of this, it, remember, um, the alternative here is that we could build another lane of motorway for you know, 30 million a mile. Uh, but actually, all of this knowledge uh, comes uh, very cheaply. Um, you know, we, we can begin to sort of overcome some of these problems you know, without having to build lots of infrastructure. These are the kind of small, clever, cheap interventions which actually uh, have the potential to yield uh, some disproportionately uh, large effects. So uh, therein lies the benefit to this kind of strong interdisciplinary uh, method of working. Now then, whether or not those small clever interventions take the form of signs which play into driver emotions or not, I don't know, but, uh, uh, but beyond being able to sort of model these effects, um, you know, perhaps we could go a step further and perhaps design our roadwork so that you know, imagine if we didn't need any signs at all, we designed them in such a way that, you know, the correct behaviour is the most natural behaviour for drivers to perform, for example. 
So that, that, that's what it offers up. But on the subject of small, clever, cheap interventions with the possibility to yield disproportionately large effects, um, I'll have to improve my marketing strap line. Uh, just to mention some of the other sort of projects that we work on as well. Um, and really, uh, they all follow a sort of a fairly familiar theme, which is that human factors problems uh, seem to be kind of everywhere. They, they, they're the sorts of problems, I'm sure you've all experienced them in your own uh, industrial domains, the problems that kind of continue to bounce back and haunt us, that seem uh, resistant to um, our normal sort of methods uh, of solving these kind of problems. Um, but I say, these are the sorts of problems which are amenable to this kind of approach. So we've got uh, various uh, activities underway. Um, uh, for example, uh, instead of looking at small things like roadworks, perhaps we can, well, we are looking at um, systems as large as entire towns. You know, um, how can we understand how resilient those um, uh, systems as large as towns are in, in the case of uh, flood risk and so forth? You know, what are the kind of human interventions uh, that go on within those systems that can help sort of mitigate uh, natural disasters? Uh, we, we do a lot of work in sort of rail and aviation human factors. Um, again, we've got the unusual situation where, uh, particularly in rail and aviation, the safety record now is, is so good that we've almost run out of accident case studies from which to learn from. But wouldn't it be nice to be able to kind of predict uh, ahead of time, uh, use the data that we collect all the time uh, in non-accident situations uh, in order to help us understand and predict uh, when uh, a risk in our industries uh, might be increasing. Etc. Etc. My final sales pitch is um, we, we have quite a good bit of capability in this area, and uh, we also have a, a wonderful new uh, MSc uh, in uh, human factors in this topic as well. Um, my name's been Dr. Guy Walker. Uh, roadworks really are ahead. Um, hopefully not on your journey home, um, but rest assured, uh, I, I think human factors may be able to help you. Thank you very much. <coughs>